Welcome back to episode 2 of the Ducati Monza recommissioning. In episode 1, I transformed the tank from a rusty mess into a glossy work of art. In this episode, I'm going to be focusing on getting the bike mechanically sound again, so the first thing is to get the carb off and stripped. A cool little feature of this carb is how the choke is actually built into the slide rather than being in the actual body of the carb itself. So with the carb off, you can see it's quite grubby and even has a fuel leak, so it's a good thing it's getting rebuilt. For those not familiar with these old carbs, here is a quick rundown. The fuel flows in through these two pipes, and to this part which is known as the float bowl. As the fuel flows in, the float rises, until the point the bowl is full, and the float presses on the float needle, stopping the flow of fuel from the tank. From there, the fuel flows into the base of the carb body. In here, there are two jets, one called the pilot and the other the main jet. As air passes through the carb body, an area of low pressure is formed, and the fuel is sucked up through the jets, into the airstream, and then into the engine. So at idle, the pilot jet is in control, up until around a quarter throttle, where the needle comes into play. The height of the needle determines how much fuel can flow through the main jet up until around 3 quarter throttle where the main jet is almost fully uncovered and can flow the maximum amount of fuel. And that's basically how it works. That was a massively simplified description but I hope it gave you enough info to help you follow along with this video without getting all confused. So. Let's crack on with stripping, shall we? So this is the float I was talking about earlier that moves up and down to shut off the fuel. As you can see at the end of the needle here, it's tapered. So once the float reaches full height, it sits into a tapered seat in the lid here and shuts off the flow of fuel. Simple.
So these are the jets I was talking about. This is the main jet and down in here is the pilot jet. So I'll pull them out and give you a closer look at them. So this here is the pilot jet and as you can see it's fairly small as it doesn't have to flow that much fuel. This one here is the main jet and the hole through it is much bigger than the pilot jet. This here is what the main jet was screwed into and this is called the needle jet. What happens is the, the fuel flows through the main jet, up through the needle jet and into the carb itself. And as I said earlier the needle controls the flow of fuel through the needle jet by going up and down. As you can see, the, the needle has a taper on it, so the further down it goes, the fuel is limited. The further up it rises, the more fuel can escape. So, let's get all these parts into the part washer. With the parts now ultrasonically clean, they are dried and given a light polish to restore the vapour blasted look.
The idle and idle air screw will be set once the engine is running, but as a starting point I am setting the air screw to one turn out so the bike will at least start and idle, albeit a bit roughly no doubt. And with the addition of the cap, the carb is now fully rebuilt and ready for use. I obviously still need to add the throttle slide and the choke mechanism, but that's done once it's on the bike. And I think you'll agree it's turned out very nice. So, while the carb is off and the engine is cold, I have another couple of jobs to do. So, let's get on with them. The valve covers need to be removed for this next step and the engine set to TDC on the compression stroke. This is done by lining up these dots on the bevel drive gears. The piston position can be checked by using a wooden or plastic stick and feeling the crown of the piston through the plug hole while rocking the rear wheel in gear. Never use anything metal to do this because the engine may turn over more than you anticipate and you could do some serious damage. As you can see, the exhaust valve is in spec as the feeler gauge fits and has a nice drag to it. So here at the intake valve tappet, you can see I can't actually get the feeler gauge between the tappet and the rocker arm, which means the space is too tight. So what I will have to do is, I will have to knock off this lock nut here and retract the tap it a bit so that I can get the feeler gauge in and then do up the lock nut and that's the tap it clearance set. With the tap adjusted to spec, the feeler gauge now fits nicely and has an ever so slight drag on it. This is another indicator that the tap is set perfectly. So all I have to do now is put the covers back on and then we can move on to the next job. If you like my Subaru and would like to see more of it, check out the restoration series in the description or up in the top corner. So with the exhaust soaking in rust eater, it's time to do one of the last engine checks, and that is making sure the points are set correctly. So these are the points and this is the condenser. I'm not going to go into a whole explanation on how the system works in this video, all that we have to know for the moment is, is this gap here between the two electrodes on the contact breaker. If this gap isn't correct, we will either end up with a very weak spark or no spark at all. So, 
Let's see if this gap is in spec. In order to check the gap, we must open the contact breaker to its maximum size. To do this, we rotate the engine so that this cam is at its highest point, pushing on this arm here. So if we turn it round, you'll see it opening. There we are, that's the cam at its highest point, and you can see the gap has opened. Now, what we need to do is get the feeler gauge. So if we grab the feeler gauge and get blades 0.3 and 0.4 out. So if we start with 0.4, you can see it doesn't really fit. If we step it down to 0.3 mil, it fits and there is a little bit of drag. So the points are perfectly within spec. So all I have to do now is put the O-ring back on, put the cover on and then we can move on to the next job. So I've removed the rear wheel so that I can get a couple of jobs done. The first one is to check the condition of the brake shoes. And as you can see, there is very little wear on them, lots of life left in them, so these can go straight back into service. The brake drum, however, is looking a little dusty and greasy, so I'm going to ask George nicely if he would vacuum out all the dust for me, and then I will give the drum a good clean down with some brake cleaner, and then we can refit the shoes and back plate. So with the brake drum now spotlessly clean, I can move on to the second job, and that is to check all the spokes. To do this, what I'm going to do is pluck each spoke like a guitar string. Don't know if you can hear the noise there, but there is a, a nice ring to it. So I will go around and pluck every spoke and make sure they all sound the same. If I find one that isn't the same, it means it's loose and I will have to tighten it up. So. I'll just speed this section up. Okay. 
So with the spokes tested on both sides of the wheel, I'm pleased to say they all sound identical. So I'm more than happy to build this wheel back up and put it back into service. There is no issues with the wheel or with the braking system. So let's get it built up and put back on the bike. With the chain now on, I need to get the wheel sitting true again before tensioning the chain. So, to begin with, I measure both sides at a point I know is identical on either side of the swing arm, and move the tensioners by hand until snug. Now when I begin to tension the chain, as long as I turn the nuts by the same amount on either side of the swing arm, I know I am still running true. This is confirmed with another measure at the end. My last job in the rear end is to grease up the swing arm pivots. Well, with the rust removed, the exhaust looks a hundred times better. It's obviously not perfect, as the chrome is all pitted and will have to be re-chromed at some point in its life.
process for the front wheel is exactly the same as the rear. So I'll just fast forward through this section. With the fitting of the front wheel, that completes all the mechanical checks, and I'm pleased to say that everything was in spec, nothing's worn, and the bike is very healthy. So what I need to do now is fit the carb and get the bike running again. I love this about these old bikes, you don't actually replace this air filter element that I'm removing just now, you just give it a wash with petrol and let it dry, and then refit it. It actually says that in the owner's manual, believe it or not, you give it a wash out with petrol. So let's do that. So there we have it, one air filter element fully refreshed. All I have to do now is leave the fuel to evaporate out for a few minutes. It's actually quite impressive to see how much dirt the filter trapped. As you can see it's, it's quite a considerable amount in there, so the filter's definitely doing its job. Now it's time to fit the tank. Let's fit the old tank rag. In fact, let's use a new tank pad. In fact, I know what's even better than that. Let's use the proper rubber mounts.
So with the beautifully restored fuel tank back where it belongs, it's time to add a little fuel, fire up the bike for the first time and get the engine nice and warm in preparation for its service. As you can see from the colour of the plug, it's a good thing we are changing it. So, let's get the new one in. When fitting new spark plugs, I always like to make sure the gap is set correctly. On this machine, it's 0.5 of a mm, mil. And that's just about spot on. So, let's get the plug in the bike.
With the carb dialed in nicely, all that remains now is to put the seat on. So there we have it, one little Monza ready for the road again. All that remains now is to get it back to its owner. And as for me, well it's about time I made a start on the new project, so I hope you will all join me again next time to see it revealed. See you all again soon!